this right here. Remember those walls. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. That they were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. But those walls are the rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now, now. Sing this out This is our God, this is who he is He loves us and this is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Face so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail. Jesus, who pulled us out of that pit, he did, he did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who rescued us from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued us from that grave, Yahweh. Sing this with me. And this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. And this is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Amen. God, we thank you for those words. We thank you that you defeated the grave. 
um, that we have life because of you, um, because of those truths that we sing this morning. Um, we sing in this place, God, and as we just lift up, lift up your name, Lord, um, we just pray that um, we would just focus on what you have for us today in this moment, God, um, just with all the distractions that we have in our world, in our day-to-day, and just the busyness um, of our lives, Lord, just um, speak to us in these moments. Speak to us now, God, um, as we just sing about who you are um, and what you did for us um, and who we are through you. Um, yeah, we just thank you, Lord. We love you. In your name I pray. Amen. This morning we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, We've been in a series for a while now that's anchored in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, That was our kind of our summer emphasis, and um, we went slowly through that for probably two months. And uh, our summer community groups talked about it. And then uh, this fall, just been zeroing in on that, on that one line, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, just as a means of review, heaven, uh, we tend to think that heaven is like the place you go, uh, the place that Christians go when they die. It's like up there in the sky and there's clouds and angels with harps and something about gold streets, uh, you know, peppered here and there. And, and, and that's largely taken from uh, like literature and art over the course of history. If you get into what the Bible has to say about heaven, um, it's, uh, it's not all that. It's really more about heaven being the place where, uh, where God is ruling and reigning. Like it's where he is the king and whatever he says, that's what happens everywhere. And it's the only will that's carried out. And so heaven is God's space. It's where he fills it up and everything that happens there is exactly what he wants. And Jesus is like contrasting that to earth. Earth is human space. And so human space is where what humans want happens. And so you have this kind of global uh, human space thing and you have all these rival kingdoms and we're watching war unfold you know, every day more and more. That's a part of it. But also, all the way down to the individual person. Like, you have a little kingdom, and I have a little kingdom. And um, we're, like, within that, the boundaries of that kingdom, whatever, whatever you say, that's what happens there. It makes you the king of this little space. Um, and uh, we don't really like anyone to tell us what to do with our space. Even if they're like, hey, sign up for the chili cook-off. You're like, don't tell me what to do in my space. This is my kingdom. Uh, I'll do what I want to do. And we're like, yeah, would you consider setting up a trunk at the trunk retreat? Would you use your kingdom authority as the ruler and reigner of your, the trunk of your car to decorate? Right, anyway, all right, moving on. Um, Jesus comes to the earth, and one of his messages is, he's like, hey, heaven is not the only place where God can rule and reign, where his will is the will that's carried out. Um, It doesn't have to be limited to heaven. Earth can be that same place. And actually, the the story that the Bible tells is that while those spaces are separate from each other, they're linked together, and they're much closer than we realize. And the story arc is saying, hey, the, the reunification of heaven and earth is what God is doing. And so Jesus comes to the earth, and, and he says uh, it's about God's will being carried out. It doesn't have to just happen in heaven. It can happen on the earth, and that can happen in your little kingdom. So that's why he teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Like, can my little kingdom space be just like heaven in the sense that God gets to do, he it determines everything that happens in my little space. And if you're married, then your two spaces are linked together. And so like in our marriage, as it is in heaven, that's like Jesus is like, no, I'm making that a possible thing. If you have a family, then your family space is like, no, in my family as it is in heaven. And everything that happens in there. And so each Sunday, I'm kind of picking a different area of life and saying within our spaces, what would it look like if God's will was the only will that was carried out in these different ways? And so we've looked at um, if God's will was, like, if, if, if when we're sitting at a table with someone, what if that looked like heaven? 
Not only in what we talk about, but also in who we're seated with. We see Jesus' ministry was not just preaching and teaching and miracles. It was also having dinner with people and not getting hung up on what they look like or where they're from or what their track record is. You know, like Jesus sat at tables with sinners and with saints. Like it was a huge part of his ministry. And so we looked at what would, the, what would that look like? What would it look like if, if God was in charge of what we what we let come in through our eyes and through our ears. Like, what are we watching? What are we listening to? What if he was in charge of what got through the gates of our eyes and our ears? What if he was in charge of how we use our speech? Um, what if he was in charge of what our, like, what our bank account looks like, where our money is going, those kinds of things? So we're getting really practical of what does it look like for his kingdom to come and for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven and all these different specific areas. And I want to talk today about how we, how we see ourselves. And I've kind of had like different, different little things. Like I talked about our tables and the gates and the thermostats of our words and our mouth. If, you, if you're tracking along, if you've been here, like, yeah, I know what those are. If you aren't, I don't have time to explain it. You can go check out the podcast if you want. But basically, I've just kind of been finding different, different like things to connect us to these themes. And I've been thinking about the mirror, you know. Like, what if God was in charge of the mirror? And I mean that metaphorically, not like, what if he was like in charge of making you as tall as you want to be, or you know, that kind of thing. Like, what if he was in charge, like when you look in the mirror, when you look at yourself and your life, what if what he said about you, like that's the will that was carried out. Like you saw yourself the way that he sees you. And a part of this on earth as it is in heaven is we have to recognize, well, how earth shapes our view of these different things. And when it comes to our perceptions of ourselves, the earth uh, has not been a very kind place to us. Um, A few uh, things, I I was trying to categorize it and trying to synthesize some things, and um, I was thinking about how much our view of ourselves is driven by what we look like, how much of it is driven by what we are able to, like, the things we're able to do with our lives and what people, have, people say about us um, and how that can go either way, you know? Like, it could make you very prideful that you look a certain way or you've accomplished certain things or people think whatever about you. It can also go the other way. It can make you very ashamed of how you look or the things you haven't accomplished, you know, the ways you've come up short or the times that people do not think very highly of you. And, and I was like, oh, there's three words that I'll start with A. Preachers love that. Appearance, accomplishments, approval. All my note takers are super happy now because you have a nice little three-point thing. But when you think about our, our appearance, our accomplishments, our approval, that's so much of how we are trained here on the earth to look in the mirror and to either love what we see or to hate what we see in our lives. And so it can make us very prideful. It can also make us very shame, uh, full of shame. It can create certain idols. It can uh, drive us to put a lot of energy into things that are very, very temporary and are changing. And it makes a lot of if onlys in our lives, right? Like if only I look like this, if only I could accomplish this, um, if only I could get this person to uh, like to say that I did a good job or that they're proud of me, that kind of stuff. And most of the time we look in the mirror, we're highlighting our shortcomings and not, our, not anything else, right? It's, it's about what we aren't, it's like what we are. And so what would it look like if heaven was in charge of that, though? What would it look like if we really believed what God says about us? Um, what if the prayer was, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done in our mirrors as it is in heaven, um, so 2 Corinthians, there's, this, there's one verse that I want to just dissect a lot, by, but also pull in the verses all around it. And it's a verse that you may be familiar with, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. There's a lot in that verse, and so we're just going to drudge through that together. 
with the idea of trying to be like, okay, I need, if I'm trying to get on board with how God sees me, I know how the earth sees me. I'm, I'm well aware. For better or for worse, I get that. What is, when God looks at me, what is he seeing? Well, let's start with the first word in 2 Corinthians 5.17, which is therefore. And one of the first Bible study strategies I ever remember learning was when you see therefore, what are you supposed to ask yourself? What's it there for? So what is it there for? And that therefore it is a transitionary word that means well, like in view of everything I've just said. And I don't want to try to sum up 2 Corinthians, uh, um, but let's just say this. Paul had a lot of critics. This was a church that he uh, was like the, the pastor of this church, and it, they were problematic, Okay. Um, they did not have their ducks in a row. And so he was trying to like shape them, and, and some, of, some of the letters that he wrote were trying to address specific things. And one of the things that was happening is that people were coming in, and they were trying to discredit him. And, um, and so he's having to kind of explain some really important things in, in that world. And so to understand what the therefore means, we need to look back at verse 11. And it starts with another therefore, and I apologize for that, but that's... Let's just, I blame Paul. I don't know. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we, this is it, what we are is known to God. And I hope it's known also to your conscience. Okay? So Paul is like, hey, what matters here is how God sees us. It's not about the critics. It's not about those, those kinds of things. Like, like who we are is known to God. And he's saying to this congregation that he loves, he's like, and I hope you, hope you know it too. Um, and then you look at verse 12. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may able, be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not what's in the heart. So this is not a modern problem. This is not exclusively linked to um, like the internet and social media and that kind of stuff, it's been going on for a long time. This tendency to focus on the externals instead of the internals. And so that's what he's trying to help them, help him to, to frame the critics correctly of like, hey, they're obsessed with the external stuff. Um, specifically, they, get, they would get really hung up on Paul's credentials. They would get hung up on uh, heritage and like lineage and those kinds of things and, and certain behavior patterns and miracles and all these kinds of things. And Paul's like, look, uh, we're not all about that stuff. You look at verse 13. This is an explanation. If we're beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Now, part of the critics were saying, like, he's crazy. Have you ever seen him worship? Have you ever seen him pray? Like those, it was like those kinds of things. We, um, we all, this, all us scholars... Uh, the scholars that I read, they say that about him, that there was this, this uh, thing that they were trying to convince everyone that he was crazy, but this is his explanation. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Paul is saying, what drives me is not my accomplishments, my credentials. And it, it isn't also about, well, let's silence the critics so, they don't, so that they like me or so that they don't mess anything up. Paul's like, look, I, I don't play that game anymore. There's something else that's driving me. And if they say I'm out of my mind, let me tell you why. Verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. Like he's been gripped by something. That's how this identity shift happens, is that we are, we're gripped by this love that we have never seen before or since. That's, that is what is controlling me. And to jump into, into the topic ap application for today, like, how controlled do you feel sometimes by appearance and accomplishment and approval? Like it's, they're the biggest bullies, you know? Like we're just so susceptible to 
letting those be the things that are controlling us. And Paul, I almost feel like he's saying, hey, I get it. I used to be the same way, but now something else is driving me. And it's not just God loves me in this kind of global sense. It's more specific. He's like, he could have said the love of Christ controls me, and he could have moved on, but he, he gets into exactly what it is about the love of Christ that controls him. I want to read it again. Uh, verse 14, the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. One has died for all. That would be Jesus. Therefore, all have died. That would be us. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. He's like, hey, this, this has changed everything about how I live my life. And so I don't live driven by appearance or accomplishment or approval. He died for me. And I live for him. Like that's, that's what you need to know about this ministry. That's what you need to know when the critics are making you question uh, Paul is saying, when the critics make you question my leadership, you just need to know and hear it from me. Something else is driving me. This is what God does. He, he changes us. That's kind of what he's getting down to. It's like, little things are different now. And then look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. He's even saying, like, look, I used to be in that camp. I even looked at Jesus the same way. If you know anything about Paul's resume, it involves persecuting and murdering followers of Jesus. So it's kind of this confessional moment of like, hey, I used to be caught up in the same stuff. I even, I even did it to the one who died for me. That's how bad it was. And yet he still died for me. Like, and so that's what the therefore is coming from. Therefore, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. It's like Paul is saying, like, think about my, like my track record when, you, when I say this. Like, I am new. And it isn't just like a practical thing. It isn't like a... Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm rerouting how I think about things. Um, It's not these six practical steps to see yourself better. It's not a self-help book. It's not a, um, it's not about getting your self-esteem up. It's not that kind of stuff. It's, It's theological, which is why he words it the way that he does. So if you look back at verse 17, therefore, Professor, you have all that, let's say. Then his next phrase, if anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. Okay, so let's talk about the in Christ part. If you're in Christ, um, it's opposed to being in Adam. And so we're going to throw a lot of verses on the screen. You can just stay parked there. 1 Corinthians 15, okay, so he's written other letters to this church, and this is an earlier letter where he says this. Uh, He says, For as by a man came death, By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so for Paul, he he kind of breaks humanity down into two groups. In Adam, in Christ. And Adam would be like Adam and Eve, like that, that Adam. And what he is saying there is that we are all born in Adam, meaning like in the like spiritual death of our first parent. So when the Bible tells the story of creation, it, it, God's helping us understand where things went wrong by saying, well, there was this couple, and they rebelled against the Lord, and it brought about spiritual death. And then that couple had kids, and then one of those kids killed the other kid, why? Because they inherited that spiritual death. And it just kept going. And so that's why we look around our world and we see uh, so much of the destruction that we're watching. When people want to get nitpicky about war, 
Uh, it's important to consider history and people groups and religious wars and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's, it's an in Adam problem. And so the implication, when Paul says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, the implication is if you're in Adam, you're still that old creation, that you are spiritually dead. And so if you're sitting here today and you're, and you're curious about that, about your own life in that, like which, like am I in Adam or in Christ, like keep, keep listening. But that's, that's, what, that's the opposition there. And so what does it mean to be in Christ uh, if, it mean, if in Adam means you're spiritually dead, what does it mean, mean to be in Christ? And th- there's a certain extent to which this is like a, a literal thing from the perspective of God. Like you are in Christ like you are in this room. And Jesus himself explained it this way in John 15. He's great at like helping us understand things. He says this, he says, as verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So what does it mean to be in Christ? It means, it means to be like unified and connected and bonded to him the way that a vineyard is put together. And so if you, were to, if you were to get really specific, so the, like the vine, we would, we're a little more familiar with trees, right? It's like the trunk, like the part that goes into the ground. And then from that trunk, all these branches shoot off of it. And if you were to be like, okay, I'm going to find the exact point where the, where the vine ends and the branch begins. I'm going to find that, that boundary. And you could get in there and you could get your knife and you could get to working and you wouldn't be able to find it. Because although they are distinct, they are connected to each other. They're unified. And so Jesus, when he talks about abiding in him, he's, he's, like, it's a, he's not just being like, what's the closest thing I can find? I think he's really telling us, no, it's like that. Like, you're in me. We see it show up in the book of Acts. This same author of this passage has this encounter um, as he's been off, off killing believers and persecuting them. He runs into Jesus on the road. This is what it says in Acts 9, verse 3. Says, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, which same guy as Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, Paul was not hunting Jesus. Paul was hunting Christians. But to Jesus, it's the same. He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? He says, why are you persecuting me? Because there's a a unity and a bondedness and an interconnectedness of being in Christ. It's maybe close to whenever, like if you're a parent and someone is like mean to your kid, it's like they're mean to you. Like there's this sort of like there's this connection that's there, but this is significantly deeper than even your connections to your kids. And so to be in Christ is it's it's that it's a being unified and bound and connected, and what is his is yours, and what's yours is his. That's the vine to the branch, right? What the vine has, the water, the nutrients, the life that the branches need to produce fruit. He's like, hey, it's, all, it's yours. I will be to you everything that you need me to be. And the branches live from the vine, producing fruits for the glory of God, the vine dresser. It's, it's an incredible thing. Um, and notice that he says, if anyone is in Christ, he doesn't say if the Jewish males are in Christ. He doesn't say if the Gentile women are in Christ. He doesn't say we have to be from here. You have to look like this. You have to have never done this list of things. That's, there's no qualifier on that. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and we have to ask ourselves, so how do you get in Christ? Like, How do you go from being born in Adam to being 
in Christ, because you might be sitting here today and you might be like completely confident, like I'm in Christ, I, I know that 100% because I know how it happens, but if you're wondering how do you get from one place to the other, it's by grace through our faith. It's not keeping rules. It's not saying a magic chant of some sort. It's not, uh, you don't have to go through an approval process by the bishops uh, around here or anything like that. Like it's as simple as recognizing I am dead and he has come to make me alive. Like that's, that's what it is. He says this in the next few verses. If you look at verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He's like, this, God has done this thing where he has brought us from death into life. Like he, he has gifted us with this incredible change and transformation Paul would say to the church in Ephesus, by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, it's the gift of God. And so God says you don't have to earn your way out of death into life. A dead person cannot resurrect themselves. Like Paramedics are driving around. If they have to revive someone, that person, that person cannot revive themselves. And so Jesus says, I've come to do that for you. You just need to believe that you are dead and you need life and that I'm the one that's come to do it by laying my life down for you. And when you believe it, his life fills you. And according to the Bible, you are in Christ. That's how it happens. And so you are hearing that, you are either confident or you are curious. And the good news is that Jesus is always, always inviting us into life. And if you are in Adam today, your faith can make, can like, is what he is looking at, saying, if you want life, all that I have is yours. Come unite to me in faith. We have a communion table over here to your right, and a part of our response time in a little bit will, will involve us like maybe stepping to that table and, and taking the meal that he has given us to remind us that it's his body and his blood that he offered to us, like he stands across the table and offers you my body and blood broken, poured out for you, that that's how life has come to us. And so Jesus is welcoming us. He said, I'm setting up a table in the room. Man, how much, what more do you need to know? How much more convinced do you need to be that I value you than the fact that I left heaven, came to the earth, and never messed up one time so that I could be the perfect sacrifice to swap places with you so that when I died, you died. And when I was raised, you were raised. And I've gone on to heaven to prepare the way, and I'm coming back, and when that happens, it's on forever. You know? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation but it's with all that in mind, he's like, well, because God has changed me, I, I'm new. Like, I'm literally not the one that I used to be. And so that's, that is when it comes down to, like, how we view ourselves is that it's not only that he made us alive. He also made us new. Sometimes I, I think it's easy to adopt kind of an understanding of all this where it's like, well, um, you were... Uh, like, you were the, an object of God's anger and wrath, and then Jesus, like, dove in front of you and, like, took the bullet. And yes, Jesus dove and took the bullet. Like, like, yes, like, Jesus laid his life down for us. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, like, there's a value there. And there's a newness that's there. And that it isn't just about what happens when you die. Will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? It's, it's about you being alive now in this moment, in all of these moments. That for earth to be like heaven, like he's making this, this thing happen among us. And so it's not that he's just made us alive. It's that he's made us new, that you're literally not the same person you used to be. That's what Paul is getting at. 
He's like, I, it's not that I've just changed my approach to things. He's like, I'm just not that person anymore. He says this earlier in the, in the letter. This is chapter 3, verse 18. It says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That, that word transformed right there, that's where we get the idea of metamorphosis. And what's the most common metamorphosis thing that we have to compare to, right? It's the, it's the caterpillar to the butterfly. And uh, I, every time I talk about this, I think about uh, Jacob Cohn, uh, whose family is the Aero Pest Control people. And one time I was talking about this, and instead of caterpillar, I kept saying worm. The worm becomes a butterfly. The worm becomes a butterfly. And he was just like gripping his seat. Like, it's not a worm. It's a caterpillar. I'm a pest control expert. Get it right. But there's a metamorphosis that happens, right? At my, at my brother's house right now on this plant, there's a caterpillar that has, it's like in the chrysalis thing. It's like happening. Like their kids are watching it every day, this like thing that happens. That's the word that we're saying. He says we're, we're being transformed from one degree of glory to another. There's this, this new thing that is happening that you're literally not the one that you used to be. So when that caterpillar goes into that cocoon deal and, whatever, and it emerges at a butterf- as a butterfly, uh, is it the same as it was? I don't think I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that butterfly is going to like, well, I kind of want to go back to being a caterpillar, you know. That butterfly is like, no, I'm not, I'm not that anymore. Like something different has happened to me. And I think this is what he's getting at when he says that when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has passed away. The new, the new has come, that you are not the one that you used to be. And I think a part of the struggle comes in for us in, in that we're like, okay, I'm tracking with you, I'm tracking with you, I'm tracking with you, but yet I'm still so messed up. You know? And I don't know if this is scientifically the same. I have not done the research, but just go with me for a second. There's this caterpillar that uh, goes through that metamorphosis and is now a butterfly. Um, but it would seem that something in there is the same as it was, Right? Like its identity is different, but there's something lingering. And I believe that, that Paul gets to this in other places of his writings where he's like, yeah, you have to be like, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's almost like if that butterfly has like a caterpillar brain or like a part of the caterpillar brain, like it kind of remembers the old ways and maybe wants to default to it, but then it's like, but now I have wings. Like I have like all this other stuff going on. I can't do I can't do what I used to do because I'm totally different, but there is something that's still there. And it's like God has left, has given us the, like this, the new heart, the transformation, like you are, you are not a sinner, you are a saint, you, are, you were dead, now you're alive, like there's this newness there. But there's something old that's happening where we're like, yeah, but I still kind of think like that. I still kind of want to do those things. I still, I still have some of those problems. And so like becoming a Christian has not like, uh, it's not like completely erased all that stuff. It's like I carry some of it with me. And I feel like Jesus is like, yeah, you do. Um, that's where your transformation comes through by a renewed mind of like, now that you are new, uh, now God's going to like teach you how to think like this new version of who you are. It's like our mind is, is catching up with our identity little by little by little by little by little. Which could be why he says we're tra- being transformed from one degree of glory to another. Like we're, our identity is new. You're not the one that you, used, you used to be. You are the butterfly. And that more and more each day he's teaching you how to think like a butterfly. How to realize that you're a butterfly. How to look in the mirror and know who you are. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. The old uh, is passing away in us as we learn more and more who we are. And so um, there are all these things that we look at as just things that define us, but they really just describe us. And a part of earth and heaven coming together in how we understand ourselves is getting more and more on board with the, like, the person God has made us to be. 
and letting him transform our lives through the renewing of our minds, refreshing it more and more where we're on, on board with him. And that's why some of these things, I think, have resonated well of like, oh, okay, so I need to think differently about what I'm watching and letting in, because I'm not the one who just watches whatever I want anymore. I kind of want to be sometimes, and I don't really guard the gates super well, but it's not who I am. It's who I used to be. But now I'm, I'm someone who's like, no, I want to pursue God-honoring things. I'm not going to just listen to anyone's advice. I'm not just going to listen to anyone's counsel in that, in that way. I'm not the one who handles my money the way that I used to. Like God's teaching me how to be a kingdom person in this way. And now that I'm a butterfly, he's like, okay, now you got to learn to think like a butterfly because that's who you are. And so it's about understanding when God looks at you, he sees a new creation. Things Brian Smith says, uh, he compares it to like the difference between thinking that you're a butterfly and then thinking that you're just a caterpillar with wings. Those are two different things. And so God's teaching us more and more that we are new. He goes on in verse 20 in this same passage Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so you are looking in the mirror, and if you're thinking like the earth, you're seeing all your shortcomings, but if Jesus was standing next to you looking in the mirror at you, He's like, you know that you're a butterfly now, right? To the point where God trusts you with the gospel as an ambassador. That you are the righteousness of God now. Paul talks about like Jesus parading us through the streets. That the aroma of Christ would fill the workplace and the neighborhoods and the grocery stores. Jesus is not standing next to you looking in the mirror and being like, we got a lot. We, oof, I don't like what I see. He's like, I see a butterfly. And I'm going to send you uh, to people who don't know how valuable they are. They don't know that they're the beloved of God. They don't know that they bear his image. They don't know that Jesus came to bring them from death to life. They're just hung up in their appearance and their accomplishments and their approval. They're dead. They don't have to stay that way. Heaven is not the only place where the will of God has to rule and to reign. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. He says, the old has passed away. This is a big theme with Paul. I already read the verses that say, when he, he died, we died. Like that part of you is dead. And, and even though there are times when it feels very alive, the love of Christ controls you. The old ways don't control you. The old way of thinking doesn't control you. The earth does not control you. The love of Christ. And we can give ourselves to the control of the earth. We, can, we do it all the time. You know? We don't have to live that way. We live that way when we don't realize who we are in him. When we think we're just a caterpillar with wings. right? But when we see ourselves the way that he sees us, it, it changes things. I think that's why he closes out verse 17. He says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know what the word behold means? I mean, it's like, look. It's almost like you're standing there looking in the mirror, Jesus is next to you, and he's like, hey, look. Like with an exclamation point. Look at what I have done. Stop obsessing over what you haven't done and look what I have done. It's incredible. God sees it all at once. I've said this a number of times over the years, but um, God sees who you are right now. He 
in the same moment sees who you were, and in the same moment he sees who you're becoming, and in the same moment he sees who you will be, like the new earth you. And there's this full perspective. Like if you could watch like a time lapse of you know, an acorn planted in the ground and it sprouts and it grows. You could like watch this time lapse of like the acorn and then you have this like fully grown stately LSU oak, you know. Like you could see that in stages, but you could see like all at once. So God's looking at you and you're focused on what you have done in your past and how you've messed up and what you're not doing now. And he's like, hold on, I'm seeing the full picture. And I'm, I'm leading you in this direction. I'm treating you as you are, as the oak. Behold, you know, look what I have done. The new has come, and he leads us from that perspective. And so the impact is profound. Um, a couple of things as I close, like what's the impact of that? Like if, if it was in our mirror as it is in heaven, like if we believe what Jesus is telling us about ourselves, um, one, I think it would, we would just rest in knowing that we are God's beloved. Like, just being loved by him. And not in a self-centered way, you know. There's a very self-centered way to be like, he did it all for me, I'm the apple of his eye, he thinks I'm the best. You know, we could get caught up in that. But there's a, that's an unhealthy way. Or there's a healthy way to just be humbled and grateful and Stunned. Or as Paul said, it controls me. Like it's, it's that profound for me. It controls me. To be made in his image as his son, as his daughter, and to be worth dying for. Second thing is when we realize who we are, there is this assuredness that he's going to take care of. Like, through all of it, whatever happens, like you matter to him. And so he's going to see you through whatever it is. Um, and you're going to be just fine. And it's not to say that we don't have to battle stuff. I mean, he's told us like suffering is going to, it's a part of the brokenness. But I'll never leave you through any of it. And if we are faithful to be the people of God, we'll surround each other as we walk through it as well. He set it up to remind us over and over again that we're going to be fine. He's going to take care of us. And even if the worst things the earth wants to throw at us happen, you can't do anything to the oak. Right? Another implication is that we will take our sin very seriously. If you are standing in the mirror and you are seeing yourself properly, that you're believing what Jesus is telling you about yourself, then you will not be casual about the sinful things that are bringing shame, not shame, that's not the right word, that are dishonoring the holiness of God and the things that are bringing destruction to you and the people around you. Part of why we're flippant about sin a lot of times is because we don't really see things the way that God sees it. But what if he's standing next to you and he's saying, hey, this is so bad for you. Like, this is eating you up. I died for that, and I want to walk you through like a, the healing process of that. Like, you don't have to battle that anymore. It will, if we're seeing it correctly, we won't be flippant about the sinful things that he is pointing out to us. Because even though he stands next to us and is so loving to us, his love also shows up in helping us see the conviction of sin. He loves you enough to tell you you're wrong about this. And if we see ourselves properly and we see him properly, we are humble enough to say, oh, if one of us is going to be right, one of us is going to be wrong here, uh, I think I know who's right and who's not right. It also will help us take the mission of God even more seriously. We realize the new creation, like what he has brought to us, and the fact that we are ambassadors, that we are sent with, the, with the, the ministry of reconciliation. It changes it. It changes the fact that we're having an event next week where we're inviting 500 kids from the elementary school to show up here. Like, 
we are ambassadors of this to them. It changes it. It's not just a, a thing we're doing on the calendar. It, bec- it takes on life. We take it seriously, and that begins with us understanding who he's made us to be. It's from our identity that all that flows. And the last thing on my list is you just know that you're not alone. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He doesn't say, I'm the vine, you're the branch. The plurality there is not a, it's not a little detail in translating into English. It's, now there's a, it's a vineyard. And vines don't grow in like nice straight rows. They're just entangled and like just, they're just a mess. And you're not by yourself in it when you see yourself properly. When you see yourself as the earth sees you, you feel like you're on an island. When you see yourself as God sees you, you're a part of something here. So what would change about your life if you more deeply believed what God has to say about you is true? That when he says you're in Christ, you're new, you're new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, look, the new has come. Look what I have done. What would what would change? I don't know. It could be massive things, could be small things, could be a lot of things. Um, but I think he like sincerely wants us to see ourselves as he sees us. Not, that lead, not in a way that leads to self-centeredness, but in a way that leads to humility, gratitude, and obedience. Like Paul is saying, like, hey, I used to be caught up in certain things, but he has changed me. And the love of Christ controls me. Because I died, and now I live through him, from him, for him, I mean, that's, that's the gospel right there. And so if you're new here or you haven't been here too many times, uh, we have a, like, whatever is stirring within you, you have to do something with it. And you might just want to, like, uh, ignore it as an option. A lot of people do. Um, but if you want to do something with it, we like to give you a few options. Um, we do have a communion table over here. And if Jesus standing across the table from you, and it won't be him today, it'll be some of our own friends, but they'll represent him. If that is like, I need to step into the story that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He took a cup and he passed it out. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you do this, You'll acknowledge what has happened until I return. Like if there's something to that for you, then that's available over here. You might just want to sing a little bit. We have songs that are kind of putting some of this into perspective that we'll sing. Uh, You can come. These steps are a great place to pray if you want to come and pray or get with some other folks or whatever and pray. We just want to give options to respond because we're not all the same. And so whatever is stirring within you, we're going to give a few minutes to us kind of being able to put some some uh, legs to that or some prayers to that or some songs to that and then we'll close out here in just a few minutes. Why don't you stand together and our musicians will come back and they'll get ready to lead us forward. And if you are here and you are, your curiosity comes down to, I'm not sure if I'm in Adam or if I'm in Christ. Um, I'm going to be on this front row down here You can come talk to me as we're responding, or I'll be around afterwards. Uh, I ain't got nothing to do. I'll be around. I'll stick around. We'll talk. Uh, Or if you came with someone, you want to talk to them, but you don't have to leave here wondering uh, where you stand. And uh, that's a part of the beauty of what Jesus has done is that it's just this all-the-time invitation uh, that he extends to us. And so let me pray for us, and we'll, uh, we'll respond for a few minutes together. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us. And as as Paul said to the church uh, in Colossae, you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and you've transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved son. 
We thank you for the redemption of sin that has come, the forgiveness that you offer us, and that although we were born in Adam, we don't have to remain in Adam. And so I pray that today your kingdom has come and will continue to come, and that your will has been done and will continue to be done, and that this will not feel like earth, but it will feel like heaven because your will is being carried out among us. So as we sing, pray, receive communion, maybe even give uh, our offerings, whatever it is that we bring to you, we want you to be honored and pleased and blessed. So lead us through these next few moments, God, as we respond. We love you, and I pray this all in your name. Amen. All right, our table is open. You can come as you're ready. Uh, as Matt leads us uh, to respond in song, um, let's just let God move among us in the next few minutes. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. Great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives in peace for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me that's depart. Son can bid me that's depart When Satan tempts me to despair It tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there Who made an end to all my sin Because the sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me and how Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory, of grace, one with himself I cannot die, my soul. Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. to 
continue to sing about who we are chosen to be um, and it's through him and through him alone sing this with me I am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen not forsaken you help us to believe that as much as you believe it. And even though we could 
we could try to make ourselves exceptions to it or dismiss it or think it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, it's a huge deal to you because it's a part of the outworking, Jesus, of you coming to the earth and laying your life down. I mean, that's, that's a part of it, and it's a part of what it means to be resurrected. Um, so help us to see it not as, a, not as a quality of life thing or how to like improve our mental health or some sort of self-help kind of thing, but to recognize like we are here because of what you have done. And so it makes us not, we're not the authors of it, we're the recipients, we're the beneficiaries of it. And so we thank you that you have done what we could not do for ourselves. And uh, would you help us to just to keep learning this little by little, that that being transformed from one degree of glory to another would progress more and more and more and more, and that we could do that from you as our vine and together as the collective branches. And may we do so in a way that it impacts our ambassadorship and how we are living lives among those who don't realize uh, just how important they are to you and what you have done for them. Would you give us the courage, give us the words, give us the, the actions, give us the countenance to do something about that. And most of all, give us your heart for the world. We do pray for um, just the many uh, crazy things going on in the world right now. We pray once again this week for the presence of your sons and daughters, our siblings who are uh, in Israel and in Palestine and for the way that your your church there, where, I mean, they are called to the same things. You have done the same work in them and they are your ambassadors there on the ground in a really hard place. I pray that they would contend well for the gospel. We pray, God, that you would work miraculous things to bring about peace and that we would seek to join you in the peacemaking process as kingdom citizens, whatever that may look like here or abroad. We love you, God, and we thank you. Uh, we thank you that this is all true, whether we can wrap our minds around it or not. We thank you for your kindness and leading us more and more into that understanding of who you are and what you have done. We love you. Pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here this morning. I hope... Uh, Hope you feel like you met with the Lord. Hope that you feel ready to be propelled back out into our world. Um, we uh, bless each other with this blessing from number six at the end of all of our services as, as both our hope and prayer, but also as a commissioning uh, that launches us back into the world. So let's bless one another as we go. We'll see you uh, next time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Give me peace. Amen.